So surprise, even though I really, really hate Banjo-Kazooie, I actually really, really enjoyed Ukulele. And I was going to do a blind run of it, because I was playing it and I was like, holy shit, exploring this game is really fun, maybe I should do blind commentary this time. So I had it all set up so I'd do a, a blind run of the game, and I fucked it up, because I enjoyed playing the game so much that I wasn't patient enough to record commentary, and I just kept playing it all the way through. So, so I, uh, I got, like, one video done of the blind Let's Play, and then I stopped, because I just started having so much fun, I quit recording it, and, uh, and that was months ago, that was, like, somewhere, sometime in 2017, I don't even remember fucking when that was, but the point is, I liked ukulele a lot, and at one point I was trying to do a blind Let's Play, only one video got completed, and I just remember that that blind... That first video of the unfinished blind let's play exists, so you can have it now. I don't know what you're gonna do with it, but you can have it. Also, buckle up, because it's like fucking 90 minutes long, so good luck with that. Have fun. Hey everyone, so let me real quick explain how this is gonna go down, because the most enjoyable part of this game to me was the exploration. I played through as little of it as possible, and then immediately decided to record it blind, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to see me exploring, and it would just be one of my normal Let's Plays. There are some small exceptions in the blind gameplay footage, as I did have to play a bit of the game to even know I liked it in the first place and that I wanted to record it, so I do know some things that happen, but most of the game is completely new to me. To make things a little more complicated, I don't do live commentary, and while I was uh, recording the game, I didn't commentate over it. So the footage is blind, but the commentary is not live, which puts us in a bit of a weird spot. Immediately after I record the blind gameplay footage, I go and record the commentary in post, which means I already know everything I did in the video, but I don't know anything about future levels or events in the game. So I suppose you could call it semi-blind commentary. Let's just see how this all turns out. Oh, <laughs> 
Alright, hello everyone and welcome to Ukulele, a game that genuinely surprised me. I don't know if I would call it good, but I wasn't expecting to enjoy it at all because I don't like Banjo-Kazooie even a little bit. And this is the spiritual successor to Banjo-Kazooie, in many ways. Before we do anything else, we need to come over here and talk to Trouser Snake because this is just how Rare names their characters. The main thing we're meant to get out of this situation is that Trouser will teach us new moves if we provide enough quills for him. And I feel like buying new moves with the basic collectible is a much better use than Banjo-Kazooie came up with. Like, the basic collectibles in Banjo-Kazooie gated your progress with a literal door. You needed a certain number of notes to break it down. In this game, your progress is again gated by how many basic collectibles you get, but instead you're using them to actually get something, to buy moves. It feels like you're getting a better return on your effort. And moves are an investment, unlike note doors. When you break down a note door, that's it, the note door is gone, and you didn't really get anything for your effort besides the ability to progress. But when you buy a new move, it has multiple uses. You'll use it countless times throughout the game to solve countless puzzles and get to countless new areas. Not literally countless, of course, but you get the idea. It's a much, much better way to deal with basic collectibles than anything Banjo-Kazooie could come up with. And if you're a little bit upset at the prospect of having to pay for all your moves now, you shouldn't be. They actually planned for this too. Trouser himself will explain that later, but for now I think we have business to attend to. We only need five quills to take to Trouser, but you should consider this area, what's it, Shipwreck Creek, where Yuka and Laylee live, to be something like a miniature world. Now, quills are the game's most basic collectible, which means they're scattered everywhere, but in Shipwreck Creek, there's only ten of them, which may sound familiar if you've played Banjo-Kazooie, there are ten Jiggies in a world. The quills are not nearly as hard to find as the Jiggies, but the way they're spread out, it reminds me a bit of a miniature Banjo-Kazooie world. And I want to believe that's intentional, considering there's exactly ten quills here. Please note, though, as I said, the quills in the rest of the game will be in much more abundance than this. Trouser says we've got all five and we need to come back now, but he's wrong, there's five more. I like being defiant in video games, so when I first played this and I noticed that there were other boxes around, even though Trouser said we had all five, I of course wanted to go see exactly how many other quills there were. There's not any particularly deep reasoning behind it, I just noticed there were more than five boxes, so I decided to disobey Trouser. Maybe this was the first time the game got its hooks in me, because even though it was telling me exactly what I should do, I didn't have to. And that's how I play most of the game. I wander around a bit and collectibles incidentally catch my eye. It's not like I'm actively searching for them, but hey, what's this over here? All this shiny stuff and a cannon. I never would have found a Blasto here if I only did what Trouser said. This is of course a reenactment of how it went at first, because I did have to play a bit of the game ahead of time. But you're getting the rough idea. And I really love the feeling this game gives me of just stumbling on new collectibles and characters. But, uh, unfortunately the old writing from Banjo-Kazooie has returned. And Banjo-Tooie for that matter. 
something I was never particularly fond of. While I can say I enjoy many things in this game more than Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie, the writing seems identical, unfortunately. It's too tongue-in-cheek for me, and while tongue-in-cheek is fine, it feels like the entire game is trying to be sassy with you all the time. Like it's self-obsessed. So this is something I just discovered while recording this footage here. I didn't actually know you could go inside that garden. I thought it was closed, I thought it was just to look at only. But I discover new things every time I seem to pick the game up, and I like that too. We can go into aim mode, and I really wanted to read the stuff on the side of this multicolor paint, but I gave up because aim mode is not first person, it's a weird over the shoulder perspective. So even though I did play a bit of the game ahead of time, many of the things from here on out are, are just pure discovery for me. Like, yeah, I knew where the boxes were and I knew how to reach them, but I didn't know about that garden entrance, and I won't know about many of the other things you'll see in this video. There's just so much stuff to find, even if some of it isn't collectibles. We have all ten quills now, so we're gonna go speak to Trouser. Now, while I don't like to make this game into a checklist because that would ruin the exploration for me, we do need to have some standard set, otherwise we won't actually complete the game. I'm not going to be using any efficiency strategies or anything like that, because that's not how I play the game. But we're going to try and get at least ten jiggies. I hope you heard the quotes around that. Going to try and get at least ten jiggies in one area before we move to the next one. That may sound like a lot, but there are way more than ten jiggies in each world in this game. You know, something that kind of blows me away is that this game was developed in the Unity engine, and I always told people the Unity engine was a good engine, and not to discount it because so many indie games with poor production values were made on it. It's an entry-level engine, and it has a lot of good features, and people should respect it. Now it seems like people are finally getting the idea, and Ukulele probably has something to do with that. This area is just supposed to teach us the rest of the platforming basics. It's really easy to pick up on. I probably would have been able to do fine even if I didn't play this area before. And up here uh, is the first time I get distracted a bit, aside from that, that thing with the garden. I look at the exit pipe and I'm like, I wonder if I can get on top of the exit pipe somehow. So I start trying to climb the rocks around the exit pipe to see if I can get up there. And I find something of a small glitch where I can slide up this incline, if I use the jump attack. So obviously I'm going to experiment with that and see how high I can get using that method. The glitch only seems to work on this incline. I can see stuff up there that I want to touch. It occurs to me I definitely am not supposed to be up here, but like, that's gonna stop me. I want to see how high I can get. Now, unfortunately, even though I do manage to get way up there to the very top of the rock face, there is an invisible barrier, and I don't appreciate that. I know you didn't expect anyone to get up here, and the stuff back there may not even be fully modeled, but damn it, I did a lot of work to get up here, and I want to see it. Come on, I, I did the work, I put in the effort. After this doesn't work, I try to get onto that, uh, that green, uh, maybe teal? That teal hatch over there, see if I can get up this way. But it's no use, it really is just an invisible barrier. It's unfortunate. I do believe we'll go see that area in just a moment at the end of the tutorial section, but I would have loved to see it from above instead of having to come at it from the front. But I guess there's nothing we can do about that. That's one of the few situations where your progress is gated by an invisible wall. Most of the time they actually do let you climb as high as you want. And the ability to climb almost anything I see is one of my favorite things about the game, but you'll see more of that later in the first world. For now, instead of trying to get up there, we're just going to climb on top of the pipe like I originally planned. And you might have noticed this silver ramp over here. We're going to get on top of that in a method they didn't intend us to either. At first I thought there might have been a collectible on top of the silver ramp, but no, it's just a shortcut back to Shipwreck Creek, where you can Laylee stay. In case we want to get back to Blasto. Because Blasto does have a Jiggy for us, but we can't get it yet. We need a special ability we don't have. This is meant to be the combat tutorial where we learn, surprisingly enough, that the square button attacks enemies. Now, I realize this is a kid-friendly game, and that it's modeled after many kid-friendly platformers, but it was marketed primarily to adults. It does try to teach us that we can eat butterflies by pressing circle to regain health, but we also learned that by ourselves. 
Either way, we're going to jump past the entire combat tutorial. This is something I also found out my first time playing. Just do a quick jump right over here, and the combat tutorial is gone entirely. Sequence breaking. You know, it did occur to me that, uh, that they really don't like to create standard heroes for these games in general. You know, Banjo, Kazooie, and Conker, they're not normal heroes. But I feel like you should also still make your main characters, you know, relatable. You want to cheer for them, you want them to succeed. But Laylee's kind of a giant asshole, just like Kazooie was. And just like Banjo, Yuka is almost entirely void of any personality. It's a real shame. If this game's characters and world were as pretty as David Wise's music, I would totally be on board with that too. But as it is, I don't like the story and characters at all. Who knows, maybe there's a surprise or two coming. And I want to clarify by world, I mean the atmosphere surrounding the characters, I don't mean the graphics. I think the graphics are fine and even rather pretty in some cases, even if I wouldn't write home about them, at least not yet. I would just like the game better if these people were people I actually wanted to spend time with. I like the game mostly for its gameplay and not its personality, but it would be nice to be able to enjoy it for both reasons. Unfortunately, this time when Trouser calls us over, we can't say no and just run around doing whatever we want. In this conversation, Trouser is introducing us to the Jiggies of this game. And we're of course going to get our first one relatively easily, but way better than in the original Banjo-Kazooie. In the original Banjo-Kazooie, it's just kind of sitting there in Gruntilda's lair, not doing anything, and you only have to hop up a couple of steps to reach it. To get this one, you have to go through a genuine platforming challenge, sure. It's very basic platforming, but it feels earned instead of just given to you. It may seem like a minor dis difference. You might think I'm nitpicking, and I may be, but it's a difference that mattered to me. We can absolutely make this text go faster, by the way. I'm just not doing it on the off chance that someone who's watching this actually does enjoy the Banjo-Kazooie style of humor. I don't. Something I will complain about, though, is that it shows us how to reach the, uh, the pagey up there. They're not jiggies, they're pagies. I mean, I can get up there myself. I don't need you to tell me how to do it. It's still better than Banjo-Kazooie, but I didn't... I didn't want to know. Let me get up there myself. I feel like when Capital B commissioned that giant statue, he should have had someone model his eyes, too. Because without his pupils, they just look wrong. You know, he looks kind of soulless. Even even Dr. Quack's statue looks better because he actually has something inside his eyes. You might have noticed that I've been using the jump attack as a surrogate triple jump, and we're going to be doing that for a while because it does get us some good horizontal distance and just a tiny bit of vertical. Makes a lot of the platforming go by way faster. You know, usually the game won't streamline you like this, but this is the only pagey that we can get right now, so we do have to climb up here. I say usually, but I don't know that. I mean usually in my experience so far. For all I know, some of the later worlds could in fact streamline you immensely. And, I don't know. Depending on how that goes, I might enjoy it. It's not like the game's platforming challenges are bad for me, they're enjoyable too. The thing I enjoy most is the exploration, but if it became a really average linear 3D platformer, I wouldn't hate it too much. I highly doubt that's what it turns into. For all the criticisms I've read online, nobody ever said the game gets too linear or it stops being open. Most of the criticisms revolve around the game being too open. People think the game is too vast, that it's too hard to find what you're looking for, and so on. Considering I don't intend to play this game actively searching for collectibles, we'll see how it all pans out. If it ever gets to a point where I have to stop my carefree exploring and rigorously, methodically search for a pagey because I need one and can't find one anywhere, then it will have a lot more in common with Banjo-Kazooie. Rusty Bucket Bay and Click Clock Wood in particular I despised immensely. It occurs to me that shit like this might be immensely subjective, which is why I'm hesitant to say that what I've played so far is actually good. And even if I finish the game this way, I'm still not sure I could call it good, but I can adequately say I enjoy it. I'm just not sure how you would how you would judge whether this game is good. Like, it's trying to be a lot of things at once. 
Unless the game starts abruptly breaking on a fundamental technical level, it's hard for me to imagine that it could be classified as bad for that reason. You know, I did play the version first without the camera patch, and honestly I couldn't tell a damn thing apart. I, I assume the camera got improved with the patch, but I can't... I can't tell. I have noticed a few glitches here and there, but nothing game-breaking, and the glitches are incredibly mild compared to other games of this genre, and other non-linear games in general. So I said earlier, if you didn't like the idea of having to pay for moves, that they did think of that, and this is what I meant. When you first open up a new world, Trouser will give you a move for free. So it strikes a fair balance between the traditional Banjo-Kazooie method of obtaining moves and the new method. And I think this works out rather well. It only seems fair to give you something fun to play with before you have to pay up, and using the free moves to collect quills to pay for the other ones also seems like a rather natural progression. But he's also explaining a mechanic here that I don't quite understand as of yet. Whenever we use our special moves, we drain our power bar, which is underneath our health. And so far, I've only seen a single reason for the inclusion of this mechanic in a single challenge. I haven't played much of the game yet, but I hope it will become far more apparent what exactly the power bar adds to the game. Just as with the first real platforming segment, the game is showing us the way to the first world, and it doesn't need to do that either, I can also do that myself. You know, the hub world is a place to explore, too. I realize there's only one place we can go right now, but you should let me find it myself. The buddy roll here is obviously the Talon Trot. They're very similar, though the buddy roll is a bit more versatile, and you'll see what I mean by that later. I almost forgot about this. We do have to learn a couple more things before we can actually enter the world and get to exploring. One of those things is that some KGs, uh, sorry, some pages are trapped in cages that will only open when we complete a platforming puzzle. These are usually my favorite pages to get because they're the most easy to stumble across while exploring and you don't have to talk to any annoying characters to obtain them. I believe this game is meant to have a fair amount of backtracking as with Banjo-Tooie. Like, in Banjo-Kazooie you could get everything the first time you entered a world and it's not as such in ukulele. But we'll see exactly how much backtracking I end up doing. This business with the pages in the one book and the grand tomes also bothers me a little. Like, I understand with Jiggies, you put the jigsaw pieces into the puzzle and it made a picture. But these pages belong to the one book, not to the grand tomes, so why do I need pages to open the grand tomes? That's not the book they're from, that doesn't make any sense. Furthermore, if the pages were spread out to hide from capital B, why are we trying to collect them and gather them in one place again? Isn't that a bad idea, to gather them all in one place where capital B could easily take them? Shouldn't we leave them hidden instead? It seems like capital B's plan is already foiled, and we're just kind of intervening where we don't need to. Maybe the story goes somewhere interesting, but I have a lot of problems with it right now, and it doesn't seem like a game with a fleshed-out narrative. Hello everyone, and welcome to the first world of Ukulele, Tribal Stack Tropics. And the second I start the level, my first instinct is to check behind us. And sure enough, if I can get the camera to behave itself, there's definitely something down there. But we're gonna go get these quills on the ramp first, because otherwise I'm going to completely forget about them. Right after this, we're gonna go look at what's down there, but if I didn't get these now, there's no way I would have gone back to get them. I do wonder how many people just march straight forward. I mean, that's normally what I would have done, but immediately, you know, I know this is a collectathon. I know there's got to be something back here. So, this is the game's version of Jinjos, if that's how you pronounce that. There are five ghost writers in each world, and they wrote these books we're in. What happens when you collect five of them? I don't know. I haven't collected five of them yet. I don't like this game's humor in general, but Ghost Riders is a pretty good joke. I'm not sure it's possible to do any better than that, I mean, you might have tapped out the pun well a little early. But you did, you did good on that one. 
Now we're, g we're gonna do something a little bit unexpected and climb on the outer boundaries of the level. Of the world, I should say. I don't know whether they intended me to do this, but I really don't care. If I see something in this game, it's a fair bet I can climb on it with enough effort. There's a, there's a distinct lack of invisible barriers, and no, you can't jump on this in this game. So you can do kind of ridiculous stuff, like platform on the outside of the world. I was trying to get up higher, because I really wanted to see how far around we could go, because I don't know what's on the very back of the world, for example. And I wanted to see if we could make a full lap around. But it doesn't look like there's enough platforms for us to do that. Unfortunately. But if something in this game looks solid, it probably is, and you can probably jump on it. And that's that's one of the things I like most about the game. You know, very few of these objects are slidey, either. They, they could have easily cheaped out and made all these objects slidey, so that way you couldn't jump on them. You know, that way they wouldn't have to use invisible barriers, but they would still stop you. But they didn't do that, either. You can climb on that. And, again, I don't know whether that's deliberate, but it's better that way. It's gonna be climbing rocks all day. So, this is another type of Ghost Rider. Only took me a couple seconds to figure out this one tries to run away. So I started doing the jump attack since that moves us way faster than our normal run does. It's also a lot easier to control than the reptile roll or buddy roll or whatever it's called. So we managed to get that Ghost Rider quickly. Each uh, type of Ghost Rider has a different method you need to use to capture it. I assume the method used to capture that one is just to trick it or be really fast. I'm not sure which we did there, but we did one of those two. A common complaint I've seen with this game is that the quills are scattered everywhere and they're not in trails really like they were in Banjo-Kazooie. And I suppose I can see why that would bother some people, but I actually, I actually think it makes the game more enjoyable. I don't know what's on top of this rock, by the way. I don't know if there's anything on top of this rock. But I know that I saw it, and it looked like I could jump on it, so I did. You could also argue that because you can jump on these areas that there should be more collectibles up here. But I don't think most people would think to come up here, right? I don't think this is something most people would do. You know what, we fell over, but we're going right back up. We're not gonna let that, uh, we're not gonna let that sheer cliff face beat us. We're gonna find our way to the top of this thing. Physics be damned, I'm an adventurer, and if there's a way up there, I'm gonna get up there. And when we get up there, you'll see one of my favorite things about this world. Yeah, look at this, you can see the whole, the whole island from up here. I see moving platforms, and, uh, I'm sure there's other stuff in the distance that I just can't see because I'm nearsighted. But I saw moving platforms. Even these plants are solid. Are these plants? Are they some kind of weird, uh, stone str- It doesn't matter, they're solid, we can jump on them. Oh, I didn't notice there's a subtle wind howling sound when you get up higher. That's actually a very nice touch. I'm just looking to see if there's anything down, like any hidden crevices like there were when we found the first Ghost Rider, but it doesn't look like it. Well, I guess we should actually go down into this area we've been jumping on top of. Seems like there's probably something interesting down there, and not just around it. So you may have noticed there's a path right here that led to nothing, and I noticed it too, of course. And I obviously just assumed it was where the world expanded at, because that's a mechanic in this game. But we'll get to that later, because the game does explain it. Does explain it to us. I knew about that before I started playing, because it was pretty heavily advertised. I mean... Yeah, that sure does look bad, but I... How about... How about you let me get the quills around here first, and then I'll help you with whatever that is. Because I know there are more quills, I can see them. In case anyone is curious, this is exactly how I play Grand Theft Auto. The only difference is in Grand Theft Auto, when you're wandering around aimlessly, the collectibles are less easy to find. Interacting with the characters is probably my least favorite part of the game, which is a shame. Again, if if the game were uh, if the game's world and characters were as lovely as David Wise's music, then I wouldn't mind at all. 
Speaking of the music, I know they got Grant on board because uh, he composed the original Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie. But the music he composed for the worlds doesn't really fit. It's far too quaint. It doesn't really have the an identity that fits where we are right now. Like, sure, this music sounds tribal, but it also sounds way, way too small for the setting. We're gonna be here a long time. And while the music does sound tribal, I was disappointed to find out that there aren't actually any tribesmen here. Well, maybe disappointed isn't the word, because I mostly loved wandering around and looking at stuff. But you understand what I'm saying. There weren't any characters that really fit the theme. I mean, this situation right here, it seems to fit the theme in a very vague sense. I get that it's a common trope, but the enemies we fight are just capital B's corporate minions. They're not actually indigenous or anything like that, they just work for capital B. I suppose I, uh, even though we did the combat tutorial, or rather jumped over it, you haven't really seen the combat yet, I have not found a reason to do anything but mash square. Now I'm not going to, I'm not going to say that this makes the combat bad or anything, because I haven't played enough of the game to make that statement. But it is very simple. I mean, I'm not even paying attention really, I'm just walking in the general direction of the enemies and mashing the button. If the loading screen is to be believed, then apparently I can chain the attacks together into combos, but I also haven't found a reason to do that yet. Then again, I haven't found a reason to fight enemies much in general. Most of the time it seems you can easily walk past them. Sometimes I hit them just because I feel like it, though. I'm not sure why the UI uh, appeared and disappeared there during the cutscene. So as you probably could have anticipated, and as I anticipated, we do get a pagey for rescuing Clara. Clara? Clara here. As I already said, we're going to try and get ten of those before we unlock another world, but that wasn't actually on my mind while I was playing. I was just kind of wandering around, looking at stuff. I mean, if I can wander around and look at the pretty scenery and jump on stuff and accidentally find all the collectibles, that's, that's ideal for me. And that's how it's gone so far. While I was jumping over this moat, I was a bit curious whether there was some way I could fill it with water. Because that seems like a mechanic that would happen, especially... Okay, here's another Ghost Rider. And it was obvious to me that he wanted to eat something, but I didn't, I didn't have something to give him to eat. So I immediately got over him and just started looking around more. You might notice that plant looks funny, the one with the crystal thing sticking out of it. I really didn't notice at the time, just walked right past it. That's gonna become, uh... It's gonna become a little frustrating later when we find out what that's for. Not the mechanic itself, but the circumstances. Normally I would have looked around the cloud a little more, but it's a, it's a talking cloud with dealy boppers on its helmet. Even if it turned out to be the worst character in the game, it's still a talking cloud with dealy boppers on its helmet. I had to give it a try. Do you get the joke in Nimble's dialogue, by the way? He's asking if we're racy. And Racy isn't what he what he thinks it. Uh. So I pretty much immediately assumed this was going to be a race before I talked to him. And after I talked to him, yes, it is a race, and it's exactly the kind of race I thought it would be. We need to use our reptile role. Now it's worth saying that although the reptile role is comparable to the Talon Trot in some ways, it does control rather differently. The reptile role or buddy role or whatever this is called. It controls more like a car than the Talon Trot. The Talon Trot was more like fast legs. But the Reptile Roll, you actually have to work to control it. And uh, that was also subject to some complaints. But it's obvious why they did that. It's because they base challenges around it. You know, if you base a challenge around the Talon Trot, it's not all that... It's not all that special. It doesn't feel like you're doing something unique. It just feels like you're putting on fast shoes. Did you see me expertly swerve between those collectibles? High-level gameplay. I say the Talon Trot felt like putting on fast shoes, but I just realized the Talon Trot has a shoes upgrade that makes it go faster. The idea is that because the Reptile Roll here controls differently, it, it makes for much more unique challenges. So we ran out of energy bar, and this is some real pulse-pounding stuff right here, because Nimble is fast, hence his name. 
So I thought we were screwed for sure and I'd have to restart. But no, we're actually just faster than him. I wish I could have said something about that challenge, but it, w it was pretty much exactly what I expected. It's not bad or anything, it was enjoyable to play, it's comparable to, say, the challenges in, in a LEGO game. The open world challenges in a LEGO game. And, uh, it is the only use of our energy, uh, what, energy or, I think it's power. It is the only use of our power bar that I've seen so far. Immediately after we're done talking to Nimble, I wanted to head back down the path because I saw something rather intriguing while we were racing right here. Those are definitely platforms, and there's definitely a hole in the wall over here. So, I had no idea what this was at the time that I first discovered it. But I know there's a pagey in here. So I thought maybe I had to do something outside to trigger to trigger the pagey's cagey and open it. Because I don't see anything in here. But when we do actually discover what this room is for, it's a little bit insulting to me personally. Now that we're back outside, I'm not going to do the thing that most people might do, which is search for a way to get the pagey. Instead, we're just going to go wander around aimlessly some more. I did see those quills over there, by the way, but going behind the temple seemed a lot more interesting than grabbing those particular quills. I end up forgetting all about them, but that's because there's, you know, stuff over here. Lots of stuff. We already have 52 quills, so I'm not sure what everyone was complaining about with the quills being spread all over the- Okay, no, that's not true. I'm being- I'm being a smartass. I knew exactly why they were complaining, but it wasn't a problem for me personally to find the quills because of my playstyle. Now that I've fallen down, I am back over here to get the quills that I should have in the first place, and I noticed that these leaves are somewhat solid because they were pushing me out of the way. So my first instinct was to platform on them, but we fall right through. Apparently they're only semi-tangible. For shame. For shame, Platonic. That doesn't stop me from doing what I was going to use them for, which is climbing on top of this rock. And I'm sure there are other, better ways to get onto that ramp with the fire, but I wanted to do it this way because I put in all the effort to get on top of this rock. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like that's going to happen. But I do notice quills up here. Clearly, if they didn't want me climbing on all this stuff, there wouldn't be collectibles. I wonder how long it would take someone who wasn't just dicking around to grab these quills. Like, would it take them significantly longer? Or would it take them a shorter period of time because they were specifically looking for them? Because on the one hand, they are very far out of the way. But uh, I'm also not, you know, my eyes aren't peeled for anything golden. I'm not rigorously searching the area for golden quills. So, this is a very simple platforming challenge you may say to yourself. It's only simple if you're patient. But I know that if I lose, I just respawn back at the start of the world. And I have, like, five hits, six, it doesn't matter. So you can jump while doing the reptile roll, it turns out. I already assumed that you could, but it's nice to have that confirmed. Now, uh, I don't actually know what's up here or what's supposed to be up here. Because there are some quills on top of this platform, but there's no way for me to for me to reach them. There's nothing for me to jump on to get up there. And we don't have a high jump like uh, other platforming mascots might. So there's nothing I can do about that right now. But I did notice a little hole in the wall. And at first I got really excited, but there's nothing in here. There's no super secret collectible or anything. It's just a wall with a skeleton in it. I mean, it was nice to be able to get in there. I don't think most games would have let you. Now, since I know there's nothing I can do up at the top here, you might think I should go back down instead, but going up higher gives us a greater vantage point to see other things around. So when I have a choice of going up or down, I almost always go up, unless I absolutely need to go down to get something that I noticed. Like, I didn't know this was over here. It might have taken me a while to find it if I didn't come over this way. Ah, uh, those leaves aren't solid either. Well, I guess they're semi-solid. I didn't even see these quills. I wonder if they spawned in when I came over here, 
or if they were already there and I just didn't notice them. This game does have some pop in. You might have seen all those pathways leading up the mountain and uh, you might have been thinking, go climb those, you know, go see what's up there. And then you saw me walk over to this rock instead and you're like, what are you doing? Why are you jumping on the rock? There is a perfectly good regular pathway to take. Well, I wanted to climb up the rock instead. I'm magnetically drawn to the... See, this is what you get for asking me to take a normal pathway. This is what happens. Now I'm going to show you that rocks are superior in every situation. You know, the music changed while we were climbing up here, and I think this music fits way better for the level. I don't understand why this music can't play all the time. Like, I get, th I get that the sounds that Grant uses are iconic to the series, but they don't always fit. You know, they're very quaint sounds. I wonder if this was higher than the other vantage point we got to early in the level. It seems way higher to me. We can see absolutely everything. We can see that fire temple over there we just climbed. We can see an arcade machine on the left, which I'm not going to go bother with because I know what that is. I did look at the promotional material, I know what that is. At first I got a bit, uh, I got a bit excited because on the way down, I thought the music was going to stay, but it quickly turns back to normal. You could actually see me double back because I was disappointed that the music changed back to normal. Eh, uh, what are you going to do about it? There are some enemies down here, but I'm not truthfully sure what they're for. Because they're not a challenge in any way. Maybe there will be more combat challenges later where they will actually do something. I just started walking right into this crack. It just, my eye caught the crack and I just started walking. That is some sick looking shit over there. But unfortunately I get distracted because I noticed this is part of Nimble's race course. And I noticed some golden quills I missed during the race course. So those take priority over that sweet ass looking face in the wall. After a moment I figure out that I'm supposed to use the reptile roll to grab these quills because it's slippery. But the reptile roll is a uh, takes a bit of getting used to. Like I said it doesn't control like the talent trot. It does take a bit of getting used to. I give up and just actually jump and get the quill instead. Hey, if it gets the job done, it gets the job done, and I've done way worse. Way worse. See, look, I don't see what everyone means, there's no note trails. Here's a trail of quills right here. Yeah, I get- I'm being sarcastic still, it's okay. I get the complaint, I promise. This is Dr. Puzz, which I assume is a pun on octopus. I assume that, even though Puzz doesn't really sound like puss. Dr. Puzz, of course, is here to transform us into this level's transformation as Mumbo did in Banjo-Kazooie and Humba Wumba did in Banjo-Tooie. I will admit it is quite nice that she has a backstory relating to the other characters and one of the primary antagonists, and it actually makes sense. It's a decent backstory, it's serviceable. It's a shame that I don't like any of the characters. None of them are really fleshed out in any way. If they're just gonna, like, wobble in place and not even look at each other while they're talking, give me something to relate to at least. It may be a stylistic choice, but I don't think we're at a point where it's acceptable for characters to not actually look at each other while they're talking anymore. Sometimes they look vaguely in the general direction of each other, but their hand movements and expressions do not match what is happening at all. Like ukulele, sorry, Yuka keeps doing that same damn hand motion over and over. You know, I was gonna talk about the excess of text to read, but it's not really that excessive. Especially compared to Banjo-Tooie, there is a lot, there is a whole lot of text to read in Banjo-Tooie. You may not have been aware, but Banjo-Tooie is actually primarily a visual novel. And secondly, a platformer. So that entire conversation was basically telling us if we find this world's Molly cool, we can take it to Dr. Puzz and she'll transform us. I will admit that I like the name Molly Cool. I'm not sure if that makes it a good name, but I, but I think someone named Molly Cool would be really fun to hang out with. As I already said, I climb up higher to get a vantage point, but I don't see anything interesting. I see the the central temple over there, but I I already made the assumption that the central temple is where Trouser is going to be, and thus where we need to buy our moves. So I don't want to go there until last. Using my patented rock climbing technique, I managed to see what looks like a shrine over here. 
And I quickly figure out exactly what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to I'm supposed to press these buttons that are on the wall, but I have no means to do that. So I just kind of leave it alone. This is of course under the assumption that Trouser will teach me a move that I can use to get those, but I still don't want to go see him yet until I have to. You know, this is an awfully big gap, but I'm sure it's nothing our, our uh, air attack can't solve. Maybe if this was a normal platformer we would have lost there, but okay. You know, mistakes happen. Oh yeah, we respawned from the last room we exited. So instead we respawn from Rampo's treasure chamber. That works fine for me. I really don't like spending any time on the ground if I don't have to. Maybe that's a uh, maybe that's what's different. Maybe that's why people complain about this game so much is because they spend a lot of time walking around on the ground, which makes it harder to see where to go next and makes it easier to get lost. But I naturally just climb everything. Maybe everyone should play the game like that if and see if it makes it less frustrating. Just if you're frustrated by how much walking there is, give that a go. Oh, hey, look. I I try my hardest not to zone out during these conversations. Mm-hmm. Uh, you got torn up by Capital B's minions and thrown in this forest in the jungle, even though Capital B's entire mission is to collect you. He doesn't want you scattered everywhere, he wants you in the tome. So why did his minions tear you up and throw you in the jungle? He actually wants you all in one place, in one piece, in the book. This is entirely counter to his plan. He's actually making it significantly harder for him to accomplish his goal, and we are making it significantly easier for him to accomplish his goal, even though he's the villain. God, God damn it, ukulele. So anyway, the torn up page, he says it was scattered through this jungle, so I immediately started searching in the jungle. The same way I search everywhere, really, just by wandering around aimlessly. And that looks interesting down there, looks like that pig is in trouble, being surrounded by corporate minions, so... I want to save him too, but after I'm done exploring the jungle. You might be able to hear something giggling in this area, and I thought that was rather weird. But I left it alone, because I couldn't see anything. You know, I called this area a jungle, and the page he called it a forest. I'm not sure it qualifies for either of those, there's barely any trees. Obviously, these metal platforms must lead to one of the pagey pieces, and I was correct. There's one left, but I certainly couldn't see it, even from high up. So I, uh... I came over here, now we're outside the forest, clearly not where the pagey is either. But do you know what is out here? Rocks. There are lots of rocks out here. So I thought maybe if we climb up on the rocks, either the pagey will be up here, or we could definitely see it from up here. I was still incorrect about this assumption. Can't see it anywhere. So as a last ditch, last ditch effort, I decided, hey, what about that pig guy? Maybe he has the pagey, and if I destroy the corporate minions, he'll, uh, he'll cough it up, he'll hand it over to us. Before we talk to him, though, I think it's fairly important to look around the area. I mean, we don't know what might be in these bushes, there might be quills. There might be that pagey piece that I'm desperately looking for right now. I had a very strong suspicion that this pig would not provide us with the pagey piece, and that was correct. But, uh, this conversation is even worse than most. Because although the characters rarely look at each other, in this one, the pig has a butterfly flapping right in his face the whole time. It's a big butterfly, and it smacks into his face repeatedly, and gets all over his candy, and it's really bothering me. Like, he's not even paying attention to it, he's not flinching. Anyway, this, uh, this conversation is about the search for Rampo's treasure. And I was already in Rampo's treasure room. But the goal he gives us isn't to find the treasure, it's to find his night buddies. So I immediately assumed that the night buddies would help us open the cage and get the pagey and that the goal wasn't to find the treasure room. If the goal was to find the treasure room, surely he would just tell us to find it. No, we need to find his night buddies instead. I wish it worked out that way. I wish my rationality uh, bled through to the game. But the conclusion of this quest, or whatever you want to call it, is rather frustrating for me, uh, personally. And I assume anyone else who found the treasure room ahead of time. 
He gives us a clue to find one of his night buddies, which is fairly obvious since we've already been there. It was where we first visited in the level, I think. We went right to that village and climbed on rocks around it and then jumped down there and saved Clara. So that would be where, uh, where his night buddy is. But first, gotta find that damn pagey. It's gotta be here somewhere. And of course it ends up being right on the, uh, right on the pathway, just kinda hanging out. The one place I never would have thought to look, straight ahead. Finding the lost pagey pieces was a fairly simple goal. You know, I did get lost for a moment there, but I feel like it still shouldn't take anyone more than five minutes to find all of those. But then again, who knows? Some people think of things that other people never would. Even stuff like busting open a barrel may seem weird to someone else. Even though that was the first thing I tried. And although we haven't seen everything yet, I'm fairly certain I took almost a full lap around the island, so I'm comfortable going to see what's up in the central temple now. Of course I happen to notice there are multiple layers to the temple, so I have to check the first layer first, otherwise why would it be here? Yes, I did cut out a conversation there, but don't worry, we'll talk to her way later. Now, I know that there is a normal way to get up there, as always, but if I can if I can use the plant instead... There we go. No. I refuse to do this the way I should. I just refuse. It's a shame the plants themselves aren't solid, or that would make this much easier on me. I'm not actually sure I can do it. Looks like I'll have to go up the normal way instead. Or... Maybe I can get on this pedestal. I'm sure it's possible. That's not that big a leap. And there are bumps in the grass here. There we go. Oh, right over it. Straight over it. But that's okay. I know which bump to use in the grass now to get up on that pedestal. Clearly, I am some kind of platforming master to be able to make it up here. Predictably, there are four quills, one each on each corner of the temple, so we're going to grab those before anything else. It may not look like there's a lot up here at first glance, but, you know, first impressions can be deceiving. And I was fairly certain that Trouser was up here, so it couldn't hurt to grab more quills before talking to him anyway, even if that wasn't what I was already doing. I can hear the corplets grunting. They must be beneath me somewhere because they're definitely not here in the temple, but I could hear them grunting and that was a little awkward. So after this brief exchange, which uses a gag straight out of Banjo-Kazooie, we actually get to start buying our moves. I think the idea behind Trouser is cute. You know, he's a shady salesman who also happens to sell you your moves, but I doubt they go anywhere with that because he has to sell you game mechanics. And if those don't work properly as part of the gag, that would be a lot more interesting. And I would support that, but I think it would bother most people. I highly doubt they got that creative with it. At this point, we do have a considerable number of quills because we went walking around the entire world poking at stuff before we even came up here. And I was hoping that would be enough to grab whatever moves we needed to get the rest of the, the pages here. Fortunately, 93 quills is almost exactly enough, as Trouser asks for 30 quills per move here. So that was a good move on our part. I can see how it would bother some people who don't, you know, wander around the level aimlessly and might not actively be looking for quills. Because 90 quills isn't really a generous price for all three moves. 30 for a single move may not seem so bad, but considering you want all three of these to do everything in the world, it's, it's a high price. There's only 200 quills in each world. It's less bothersome for me because of the way I play the game just walking around doing whatever, but again, I can see why it would bother someone who's actively trying to complete the game. The three moves available to us here in short are a butt slam, the ability to slurp berries and shoot them back out, and the ability to use Laylee's sonar. And because I would really rather not watch Trouser explain all three as we slowly purchase them, I'm going to skip past this conversation. And now that we have all three moves, some things come to mind. Trouser said that the sonar could reveal hidden platforms, and there's a hidden platform right here. So that seems to work out rather nicely. We use the sonar with triangle, and it is tied to our power meter for some reason. I can't imagine us spamming it, so I, I can't figure out why it would need to be tied to the meter. Oh well. 
And as you can see here, I was wrong. I misremembered. The corporate minions were above us instead of below us. You know, this looks a little conspicuous to me. These are definitely the floating platforms that we saw way earlier, by the way, when we climbed to the top of the level. That's definitely where these are from. We didn't take fall damage, which is a little odd. I'm pretty sure that was a that was a decent sized fall. This next time we do manage to make it successfully across the platforms and we find this world's Molly Cool. Which if you recall we should give to Dr. Puzz so that way she can transform us. But I see something a lot more interesting that the camera pans over right here. Looks like there's a cagey with a pagey in it just over to our left. So why don't we jump over there? We'll see Dr. Puzz later. And of course, as we know, we can't open the cagey without solving a puzzle, so we should go look around this area for a puzzle to solve. Looks like we would have ordinarily have to do uh, some really strange platforming to get over here. But we're not quite out of the woods yet. After all, we do need to solve a puzzle, and there's a high chance the puzzle will involve these ramps in some way. I'm not really sure why I was scooting the camera back and forth like that. Maybe there was some weird thing in the environment I was looking at, but I couldn't see it now. Of course, it seems obvious now that the puzzle is going to be triggered by that switch right next to the cagey, or at least a relatively close distance from it. And at first I think we're going to have to use our new ground pound move, but just stepping on it seems to activate it perfectly fine. Now this is another common complaint about the game, uh, these timed hoops. And I understand that time trials can be frustrating, but I find if they're fair, they can actually be very enjoyable. And while this one is a bit difficult at first, because I do have to platform with the reptile roll where I hadn't before, after I get the hang of it, 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 it uh, becomes a fairly easy challenge. Nothing unfair about it. In fact, the biggest problem wasn't me getting used to the controls, I think it was just me jumping at the wrong time repeatedly. I jumped when I didn't need to, which really screwed me up for, uh, for, the, next, for the next platform where I did actually need to jump. So with the new knowledge of my failures in hand, this time should be the one where it all goes fine. Bit of a curve there in the air. But it seems like we got through alright. Thankfully we don't have to go through all the hoops with our reptile roll and we can instead just jump through them if we need to. Now maybe I'll go see about Dr. Puzz. Yes, thankfully I didn't get so distracted that I forgot what I was originally doing, but that might just be because Dr. Puzz was still within my line of sight when we finished. An unfortunate thing about the transformation we'll receive is that I've really only I've really only noticed one pagey that we could possibly get with it. Now of course I could easily be missing something because in my style of play I don't actively search for everything we could be doing. But I really only noticed one thing. I should note again, I mean only one thing we could do to get a pagey. I did notice at least two things we could do with the transformation, but only one of them gave us a collectible. Or rather, only one of them will give us a collectible. The same gag used in Banjo-Kazooie, I believe, also occurs here, where they transform into something that's not intended. Like, oh no, that's not a fearsome monster, it's a plant. Surprise, surprise, it didn't go as anticipated. It was only foreshadowed very heavily. Fortunately though, Dr. Puzz tells us that we can use our plant spray with the square button, and we're immediately directed to what we might use it on, but first I'm gonna spray Dr. Puzz in the face. I didn't expect her to react, and she doesn't, but it's still a little bit, uh, little bit underwhelming. How am I supposed to be attached to Dr. Puzz if she doesn't react when I spray her in the face? As is, uh, normal with Banjo-Kazooie games, they just slap some eyes on a plant, made it a character. I understand that's a common criticism of the character design in the Banjo-Kazooie games is that they just slap googly eyes on everything and now it's a character. Personally, it never bothered me and I thought it was kind of cute that they tried to make everything sentient. It's especially funny in Conker's Bad Fur Day where the characters are less than pleasant. But this time, for good reason. You know, that game's actually trying to be stupid and mean. I mean, honestly, it, it kind of feels like Conker's Bad Fur Day is what they should have made in the first place. The humor was always on the mean side, I suppose. 
It's just that in Conker's Bad Fur Day, they were able to go all out. Definitely, uh, everyone has a bit of an edge to them in Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie. Just in Conker, it's way, way more noticeable. Actually, I'm not sure if... Maybe edge isn't the right word. Abrasiveness may be a better word. In Banjo-Tooie, the characters definitely have more personality, and the story has more personality. But Conqueror has far more personality than either Banjo-Kazooie or Tui or Ukulele. And I think that's because they took this style of humor as far as it would go for Conqueror. People like to point at Conqueror as a deconstruction of the happy 3D platformer. And it may be for most, but it seems like a natural evolution from Rare's previous games to me. God damn it, I did the thing again where I accidentally talked over an entire section of gameplay. I feel like you got the idea just by watching though we spray the plants, mix them bud, and we had to shove a couple of physics objects out of the way to make the platform lower. It's pretty simple. And again, this was the only page I could find that actually required the plant. Now we're gonna try and spray the plant that gave us the page but she doesn't want anything to do with that. Now, of course, as one would naturally wonder in a persistent world like this, what happens if she sees me transform back into a lizard and a bat? You know? Surely there's dialogue for that. It turns out there is no such thing. So now it's back to wandering, and there is this giant moat just kind of hanging out here, so that seems like a good place to check. I do know that the moat seems to link up to that arcade machine up there, so I don't want to go up there yet. But it seems like there are goodies under or in the moat too, like this coin. Which it only took me a couple seconds to figure out I need to jump on some rocks to reach, because that is, that is what I am best at. And this is yet more evidence to support the idea that they wanted you to climb on every rock in the game, because if not, why would I need to climb on that rock and the other rocks that had the feathers, quills on them? So I stumbled into this plant here and immediately assumed that there would be another pagey waiting for me if I would go to Dr. Puzz and transform, but on my way back to Dr. Puzz, I remembered this little thing. I already immediately knew what to do from last time, and now with the butt slam, it was incredibly obvious exactly how I was supposed to carry it out. It seemed like an easy challenge, but I got a little bit cocky and tried to jump over the knockoff connect instead of just uh, dodging the green laser, so now it knows where I am, and it's really pissed. And it's going to be shooting at me constantly, but I'm not going to stop the puzzle just so I can avoid dying. I mean, we're already halfway through. These are the kinds of pages I prefer to find. I don't... I mean, that's unusual, because I usually prefer helping people in these games in order to get a collectible, but... Anyway, I do believe I was headed over to Dr. Puzz before we got distracted. But getting distracted is fun. And it seems that I just took a stroll right, right past Dr. Puzz. I don't know what I'm doing here. Maybe I'm trying to get more health? Yeah, maybe I'm trying to get more health. Which is weird, because I don't really need it, death has no consequence, just walk past a butterfly, I guess I'm not trying to get more health? Or am I? What the hell are you doing, me? So it turns out I just took an entire lap around the map for seemingly no reason, but I did manage to find the location of yet another flower while I was doing so. So I guess it wasn't for nothing. I do remember where both flowers are, thankfully. So we're gonna go talk to them and spray them. Maybe spray them first and then talk to them? I'm sure the exact order doesn't matter. I don't know why I was hesitant to come up to that guy from behind. So, it turns out that these plants actually just, uh, just give us hints as to where the collectibles are. Which is a little bit disappointing. He also isn't a big fan of being sprayed in the face. I mean, if you're sure. But that was like kind of a one-time offer thing. It's not like we're going to be coming back. So it turns out that our plant spray can actually hurt the corpulates, or at least stun them. But it's not a very efficient method to, to get rid of these guys. So you might, might as well not bother with it. Even though I knew at this point that the previous plant wasn't going to cough up a uh, pagey, I decided to go and check the other one anyway because I'm already in the plant form, I might as well. 
But he just does the same thing, gives us a hint to a collectible, and I don't I don't really care. You might have noticed that the previous plant even gave us a hint to a collectible I hadn't found yet, but I didn't go and get it, because I don't care. So since I can't actually think of anywhere I haven't looked yet, and I do recall seeing some seeing some breakable uh I only take a look at them for a spare moment, and it's incredibly obvious what they're for. Apparently we don't actually need to butt slam on top of them either, just doing it next to them will be fine. And then we get dialogue of a fellow telling us to break the other three breakable blocks, which we were going to do anyway. I mean, they're breakable blocks. Do you think we're only going to mess with one of them? Don't be silly. Actually, it would have been cool if we waited if the game waited until we broke all four before he said something. I think that actually would have been a lot better. So now that we'd, uh, we've apparently cleared up all of the junk that was blocking his windows, which was there for some reason, we can enter the front of the temple, which I had miraculously neglected this entire time without even paying mind to it. So you may recall we purchased three moves from Trouser, but have only used two of them so far. So far, We're about to find out exactly what the third one is for. Or at least one of the things it's for. So welcome to Duke's Temple. Very small area, even though this is apparently Duke's Temple. So Trouser should really not set up a business here. That seems kind of, a uh, rude and illegal. Assuming property is a thing in the ukulele universe. I mean, business is clearly a thing in the ukulele universe, so I would assume owning property is a thing. That reminds me, the quills we trade Trouser aren't really currency, are they? I mean, he says he wants them because this book business is booming, I believe was his reasoning. And I'm not sure I understand that. Like, the books Capital B is capturing, I'm pretty sure they're books that have already been written. And Dr. Quack said they weren't really interested in regular books, just the one book. So I'm not sure how Quills would help Trouser in the long run. Like, why does he want them? At, uh, I... Don't... Don't give me weird-ass excuses if you don't want me to think about them. So basically what Duke here is telling us is that we're going to be using our ability, the Slurp Shot, to shoot targets that he set up for us, and if we shoot enough of them, he will give us that pagey that he was using to wipe his ass with. Which is lovely. And for some reason, they don't make a joke about that, which seems... I mean, they make a joke about him using it as toilet paper, but neither Yuka nor Laylee react to having to touch the paper, which is unusual for this style of writing. So I did skip Trouser's explanation, I cut it out, but what we have to do is grab berries off of one of these bushes with our tongue and press square to shoot. Now I am using the aiming mode, which I used in the first video very briefly to look at a can of paint. And if you're curious how this works, because I understand some people take a while to figure it out, you click in the left stick. I don't know what you do on computers, but if you're playing on PS4, you click in the left stick to do this. It is a rather easy challenge, just as the previous one where we used our butts, uh, butt pound to press the switches. I understand this is the first world, but these are challenges that people have probably seen many times back when 3D platformers were more popular. Maybe more so in 6th gen than in the 5th gen, but still. Hopefully as we go deeper into the game, more of the challenges will revolve around actual 3D platforming. Because that, uh, that challenge with the hoops and the reptile roll was kinda nice. I mean, exploring is still... still the main thing I'm getting from this, but... If when we actually did get to a page I had to platform, I wouldn't complain about that. Upon exiting the temple, I look straight ahead and think, Hey, isn't that where that corporate village was, and that's where that night guy said I could find his buddy? And indeed, here is Sir Lutz a lot. At this point, I wouldn't blame Sir Scoffs a lot if he just assumed we had given up on the quest entirely, because it took me until just now to remember it. In, in both timelines, in the timeline where I was already playing this, and right now while I'm commentating. I like that corporate, not doing anything, great programming. It's not bothering me nearly as much as the butterfly, because at least I can make a joke about maybe the corplets being so simple-minded that they actually wait until someone's done talking before they attack. And you could actually stop them just by chatting. 
But with the butterfly, there's no real joke to be made there. It's just a butterfly slap. That was really rude, sir. So the clue that Sir Loots a lot gave us, obviously referring to the island with the arcade machine on it, which I'd been avoiding this entire time. And in order to figure out exactly where it was, because I had forgotten... I mean, that would have been really cool to have when we were actually doing this, this pagey mission. But anyway, in order to figure out where the arcade machine is, because I had forgotten, we're gonna climb all the way back up here. Never mind the fact that I accidentally panned over it a few times just now because I didn't see it. So the reason I've been revo uh, avoiding the arcade machine for so long is not because I think it'll be bad, but it, it's a mini-game. They're all mini-games, and I wasn't really in the mood to play a mini-game. I was in the mood to platform and explore. So even if the mini-game is perfectly fine, probably probably not going to enjoy it super much. So I spend a while dicking around on these rocks before I eventually move back over to the left and realize that the arcade machine was over there the whole time and I probably, probably didn't need to come over here in the first place. Oh well. It still looks pretty up here, you know. You may recall this area, it's where we found that coin and that coin is indeed for use with the arcade machine. Just need to hop our way up there. Unfortunately, this is the easiest way to get up there, and I couldn't find any rocks around to climb on. I mean, I guess these stones are a kind of rock, but you know what I mean. That's a, this is not what I'm looking for from ukulele. So I immediately decided to check behind the arcade machine, and of course the knight's back here. Where else would they have hit him? On top of the arcade machine... On top of a rock. Yeah, they should have hit him on top of a rock. I think that would have been ideal. So this conversation with Sir shoots a lot takes a while, but he tells us to go find Rampo's treasure chamber, which we already found by coincidence, and it's at this point that I realize they didn't expect me to find it ahead of time. Which is a little irritating. I mean, ukulele were already there, so they know where it is. Why, why isn't that in this conversation? Why not have it closed off until, gi until they give me the clue? Any anything. Anything at all. This is almost exactly the kind of thing that Laylee and Kazooie were made to make fun of. Like, shouldn't Laylee be complaining right now that they already found it ages ago? Shouldn't Yuka stop doing that same goddamn hand motion every time he talks to anyone, even when he's not saying anything? So while we're here, I figure we may as well go and deal with the arcade machine. Again, it's not that I thought it would be bad, I just was not in the mood to play a minigame. While we're talking to Rextro here, I feel it should be said that I believe Platonic stated that every character in this game was designed so that they may one day appear in their own video game. Now this actually isn't a bad policy for designing characters. If you make every character interesting enough that you want them to star in their own game, then you'll have a cast of incredibly engaging ca- that's not what happened here. These characters are all incredibly one-dimensional and boring, and they would not make good video game stars. Hell, Yuka and Laylee don't make good video game stars. It's like all the characters so far are based off one-off jokes that Platonic chuckled at a few times and decided that was enough to base an entire fictional person around. Corplets are stupid, but Duke was smart, and this is a modern video game, but dinosaurs are old, and Rextra was old, and he plays arcade games. This is really, really impressive writing. Maybe I just have an incredible amount of bitterness left over from Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie. The first arcade minigame is rather simple and reminds me a little bit of that top-down minigame in Kirby Air Ride. I can't remember what it was called, Kirby Top Ride or something like that. But yes, it reminds me immensely of that. It's a top-down racing game where we drive around in a minecart named Kartos. Now, Kartos controls remarkably similar to the reptile role, which means that it does take some getting used to, and especially in a course with this many tight turns, it can be a little difficult. Fortunately, we have a whole five minutes to complete five laps. So I just kind of zoned out while I was playing this. And I still managed to make it to the end just fine. There are a variety of power-ups, such as a speed... No, okay, I say a variety of power-ups. I've only noticed one power-up, that being the speed boost. And there is a power down, which seems to make us slow down or reverse our controls when we touch it. 
I wouldn't say there's anything particularly wrong with this minigame. It is a bit difficult to control, but that's by intention, and after you get used to the handling, I imagine you could do it with uh, incredible precision and speed. Like, if I were to play this minigame five or six more times, I feel like I would have adequately memorized it and had my muscles map to how the cart controls, but I have no intention to do such. It is worth saying that if we play the minigame again and manage to beat Rextro's high score the second time, that we will get a second pagey from this minigame, but I'm not doing that. I have no intention of doing that for any of the minigames, unless I really, really like them. Alright, now that we're done with the Rextro's arcade machine, we can collect our pagey from him, though it does seem weird that he wouldn't give us the pagey if we asked nicely. Like, one of the few character traits Rextro has is that he's rather ditzy. He's incapable of believing that his friends who had abandoned him actually had malicious intentions and still thinks they're going to come back. So I feel like he'd just hand over the pagey if we either asked nicely or tricked him into giving it to us for some reason. And no, Rextro, I'm sorry. In fact, I really don't want to play the game right now. Maybe, maybe some other time, but I doubt it. Not anything against you or your game, personally. So I did notice, of course, that there were quills on top of the arcade machine, and thus it's very important that I get those. And who knows what else may be up there besides quills, maybe even more rocks. We can't pass this opportunity up. But for real, we want, we want as many quills as we can get. We don't know how much other moves will cost later in the game. And I will say that I do appreciate that climbing on the rocks on the outer boundary of the level does lead me to more quills here. Now I do believe we have a date with Rampo's treasure chamber. Here we are again, in a place that we found very early in the video. And now there's a knight in here that we definitely would have noticed before, but I guess she just teleported in here now. And still no mention of the fact that we found this room before. You know, I think I preferred the pig NPCs in Freeze Me over these pigs. So yes, this was essentially a really weird game of hide and seek that ended with us getting a pagey. I guess there's nothing really wrong with that. This actually successfully brings us to 10 pages, as there are now 9 that we've gotten from Tribal Stack Tropics and the 1 that we got from Hivory Towers. So we can now go unlock the next world unless something distracts us on our way out of here. So this was a pretty, pretty enjoyable time. I mostly like the exploring, but I wouldn't say there's anything bad about the challenges, they're just kind of unremarkable. As I said, ideally later in the game the challenges will get a lot more uh, challenging. Even though I had a lot of fun playing it, commentating over it was a far more daunting task than I imagined, but I do, I do post commentary, so that may have something to do with it. I don't know, I've got a whole lot of time to decide if I want to make any format changes or switch anything around. You're not going to see this until months after I finish the whole project. And of course I did manage to get distracted on the way to the exit, because I hadn't even noticed this before. Now, in spite of you just seeing me shoot a totem with Laylee's sonar and that making the invisible platform appear, my brain for some reason decided that shooting the invisible platforms themselves with the sonar is what made them appear. I must have been really tired. After I eventually figure out what's going on, I look around in the environment for more totems, and it's kinda cute that they're hidden away like that. I mean, it's nothing that a quick sweep with the camera wouldn't help you with, but it, it's a little better than just having them sitting out in the open. It's worth noting that the sonar does spread out the further it shoots, which makes it really hard to miss the totems as well. This is definitely one of the easier pages to get. Would be a shame if I did miss it. Man, yeah, I must have been really exhausted at this point or something, though I do I do very much recall having fun, and that was only yesterday, so it can't have been that bad. Keep in mind that everything you've seen here, as the pages I think I've mentioned once already, everything you've seen here is the vanilla version of Tribal Stack Tropics, and it is possible to expand it. But instead of doing that, we're just going to go around and unlock new worlds, and only come back to expand... Yeah, he's telling us right now. We're only going to come back to expand Tribal Stack Tropics after we're done with all the other vanilla versions. 
What I'm doing at this point is, as you just saw, I ran into the hungry ghost rider on the way out the world, so I'm trying to grab the, uh, the berry from inside Duke's temple to feed to the hungry ghost rider. If you remember the first time we saw the hungry ghost rider, this might seem incredibly stupid, as there is a bush of berries, perfectly good, usable berries, right behind the ghost rider, that for some reason I forgot about entirely. Of course the power-up runs out before we actually get there and get to use it, and I just give up and go for the exit. This could have easily been avoided if I had, uh, if I had even looked a little bit over to the right where those berries are. But maybe I was just that tired. Ha 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 